Hi, I'm Bethany Dara. I'm an occupational therapist, and I'm here to talk about sensory processing for parents and teachers. So to start, let's talk about what sensory processing is. So sensory processing is the way that our nervous system receives messages from our environment. Um, the senses take in that information, and then our neurological system turns it into appropriate motor and behavioral responses. So all the sensory systems have to be communicating together fluidly, and everyone processes sensory information every single day. We hear the phrase sensory processing disorder, and I want us to just think about this as when um, our body is not able to organize and respond appropriately to sensory stimuli to the point where it affects the way that we function and it, and it prevents us from functioning typically and in our school or work setting. Everybody has differences in the way that their sensory systems work and that isn't a dysfunction. So everyone has those preferences. So strong sensory preferences can also be a symptom of many different underlying issues such as anxiety, ADHD, or trauma. But sensory preferences are just a normal part of life. So I'll give an example. Um, for example, if I'm in a store like Walmart with um, lots of sounds, bright lights, um, a lot of visual stimuli, a lot of people moving past me in different directions, I'm going to be um, uncomfortable. Those, those are all the things that are opposite of what my sensory preferences are. I prefer dim lighting, um, very quiet environment, um, slow moving. And so if I'm in a place like that, I'm going to have heightened awareness. I'm going to be irritable. I'm going to be cranky. Um, I may have anxiety. I may snap at my kids. So that's an, that's an example of when I'm in an environment that doesn't suit my sensory preferences, how that may look. And that doesn't mean I have sensory processing disorder, um, but it is something that I'm aware of and affects the way that I function. So that's why we want to talk about sensory processing for teachers and parents, because even for our students and our children who don't have a disorder and aren't getting therapy for it, there are little things we can notice and adjust to improve a child's functioning, the child's engagement, um, a child's comfort level. So these are the things I want to teach people to look out for and, and help make those minor adjustments to teach kids how to find their own preferences and regulate. So these are a list of behaviors that you might see if a child is not comfortable in their sensory environment or they have sensory processing disorder. You may see rigidity, impulsivity, difficulty with transitions, tantrums, they may be high strung, unable to calm down or dysregulated, disregard of others and attention problems. So back to my story about when I'm in Walmart, you're gonna see me high strung and inability to regulate and that high strung may come out with a disregard for others and snapping and, and talking unkind to my kids. So that's how that plays out um, for me in that scenario. There are seven sensory systems that we're going to talk about today. Five of them are very common and, and everyone's pretty familiar with tactile, visual, auditory, gustatory, and olfactory. Gustatory being your sense of taste and olfactory being your sense of smell. The two that are actually most important for what we're talking about today, but are least known, are the proprioceptive and vestibular senses. And we'll talk more about what those are um, in upcoming slides. Now take a minute to think about your own sensory preferences. What are they? When your needs aren't met, when you're in an environment that doesn't suit your preferences, how do you react? How could someone tell? Take a minute and think about that. So there's two different responses to any sort of sensory stimuli beyond just a typical response. So the unusual responses would be an over-responsive or under-responsive. So if you're receiving a stimuli like um, a sound or um, flashing lights or something like that that's coming in, your eyes or your ears are taking in that information, your body may over-respond to that or under-respond to that. So let's take the example of um, a fire alarm. So 
with an over-responsive um, response to a fire alarm. Um, it's kind of a panic. It's too loud. It kind of makes your whole body shut down instead of responding appropriately, which would be to exit the building. So if someone's having an over-responsive um, sensory response to some kind of stimuli, they're going to avoid that sensation. So the first thing you're going to see is for a fire alarm covering the ears hunkering down, locking up, they're going to be sensory defensive. They're um, not going to want you to touch them. They're not going to want any additional stimuli. They're going to be hypervigilant. They're going to be in what you would call a fight or flight mode. At this moment, that fire alarm is danger. And, and this is now a survival situation for them. They'll be stressed and definitely overstimulated. So in a situation where a child is showing signs of over-responsiveness to something, the best thing to do is remove that sensation. Um, obviously, in, in the situation of a fire alarm, you have to get out. Um, so getting out would remove the sensation. Um, but in other situations where you can, the, the classroom is playing a really loud game and one child is showing these signs, some headphones or maybe taking a break out of the class would be the way to help them through this. And we're going to go through each sense and talk about specific strategies for each one as we come up. But I want you to get an overview of um, getting used to think of things as over or under. An under responsive response would be sensory seeking. They want more of that stimuli. Um, they may, um, if, if the if the auditory, so we're talking about a fire alarm right now, so the child doesn't really have control over that. But if it was something that they did, like a loud toy, they may press the button over and over and over and over and over and over again and stem on that toy. Um, you may see poor body awareness. So this is for our kids that have poor um, responsiveness to the sense of touch or body awareness, that proprioceptive sense. And so they are seeking that kind of input everywhere. So they're bumping into things and kind of unclear of where their body is in space. They may be very wiggly because they're looking for input and they're gonna be very active. They are always looking for more stimuli to give them information about their environment. So providing extra sensation for these, childs will be, for these children will be the strategy. Many times kids may under respond to one sense and over respond to another. Feeling overstimulated in one sense makes a kid seek a calming sensation. So this, the example of this would be a loud room. So you might have a loud room, a kid is over responding to the sound, but they're touching their neighbor or leaning on their neighbor or even pushing their neighbor. That's because they are looking for proprioceptive sense from that child to help calm them down from the auditory sense. So you may see a mix like that where you say, well, they're showing me signs of under responsive. So what do you mean I need to remove the sound? You know, you just kind of have to look at the mixture. It's all different. The proprioceptive sense is oftentimes a regulator. So kids will often look for that sense no matter what's going on. So let's start talking about that, that system. This is a sense of your body and space. The receptors are located in the joints, and it can be simulated by pressure, stretch, vibration, weight, or weight bearing. So the example of this is if I have my eyes closed and someone comes up and moves my right arm into a very specific position, with my eyes closed, I could mimic that with the left arm because my brain can sense how much and in what direction each one of my joints is bent or stretched and it can re replicate that on the other side. That's my sense of proprioception. So to activate the sense, you're gonna be wanting to do um, weight bearing through the joints. Think wall push-ups or wheelbarrow walks or crab walks or carrying heavy backpacks, things like that. This sense organizes all other systems. So a lot of kids use this sense as kind of their thermostat. Um, they can adjust how much input they're getting into their body and it kind of levels out everything else. So heavy work is very calming. This is why a deep hug or cuddling or weighted blankets are very calming across the board. So an over-responsive proprioceptive system is very rare. Often I, I hardly ever see kids who have too much heavy input. Um, they are usually craving more and more because it's so regulating. But an under-responsive proprioceptive sy system would be when a child wants to cuddle and they're leaning on objects, they're 
jumping or crashing, maybe they look clumsy, maybe they're bumping into people all the time. They're looking for that input and they're trying to get it from their environment. So since over-responsive is rare, we will rarely need to remove input. But it is important to know that there are limits to how much weight um, you can put on a child as far as um, weighted input. So we're only going to use 10% of their body weight. And compression items should be monitored to make sure that they're not too tight. Um, that's just for the safety of the child. But there's you usually won't have a child asking for less because this is usually very regulating. Um, for an under-responsive child, we will provide input. So compression garments are one of my favorite ways to go. And it could be as simple as um, an, a really tight Under Armour shirt or rash guard underneath their clothes just to provide that squeeze. And when you have the shirt on, if you can get two fingers in between the skin and the shirt without a whole lot of space, you know you have the right um, amount of compression. Weighted lap pads. I like weighted lap pads um, more than weighted um, other vests or, or things like that because kids can remove them when they need to and it's not a restraint. Heavy jobs such as pushing or pulling heavy carts Cleaning the boards and the windows really get that push through their elbow, their wrist, their shoulder. You're getting a lot of upper body um, weighted input there and all kinds of animal crawls. Make them up, seal crawls, um, crab walks, dog walks, bear walks, or whatever animal they can think of and get creative and, and walk like. Um, bunny hops are all fun ways to get kids to do some weighted input. The vestibular sense is our sense of balance and movement. Receptors are located in the inner ear and allows us to identify how our body is moving. It's stimulated by linear and rotational movement. So linear movement would be like a traditional playground swing that goes back and forth and back and forth. And rotational movement would be something that spins like a sit and spin or a merry-go-round. There are um, these canals in your ear that kind of curve around each other like this, and when you move in different directions, different canals are stimulated. An over-responsive reaction to vestibular input would be motion sickness, or feeling dizzy, or being gravitationally insecure. So this is a child who's afraid of heights, or doesn't want to climb up to the top of the slide. Under-responsive would be a child who doesn't protect themselves when falling. They're spinning, they're rocking, they're a daredevil on the playground. So to remove input, these kids are going to find sedentary activities. You don't often have to remove input for them because they are going to go find the sedentary activities. They may benefit from a close model instead of lifting head to look at the board often. So when they're copying from the board, um, the vestibular input it requires to look up and then down the paper and up the board and down the paper may actually make them motion sick. So giving them a model that's right next to their paper so they can just look a very slight move side to side instead of that big up and down may help them. To provide input for these kids, swinging, um, a rocking chair, wagon rides, tricycles, a sit and spin, even an office chair that can kind of twist um, could be helpful for these children. The tactile system. This is our sense of touch. Receptors are found in the skin. It receives information related to touch, pressure, pain, temperature, and stereognosis. Stereognosis is the ability of your hands or any of your skin to um, feel the shape of an object and recognize what it is without looking at it. So an over-responsive reaction to tactile would be a child who avoids touching glue or grass. They may be sensitive to clothing tags, very specific clothes they can wear, very specific socks they can wear, and they may overreact to light touch. So that's when somebody barely brushes up against a bed and they say, hey, you hit me. Under responsive would be a low tolerance for pain. These are the kids that are coming into school with bruises and burns and, and they can't really remember what happened. Um, they may have an under responsive tactile system. They can't feel the food left on their face. Their face is always messy and they're constantly touching people. Play. They're the ones that are playing with the person's hair in front of them or rubbing their shirt. To remove input, we give them more comfortable clothes. 
we take away the tags. We ask them to wash, we remind them that they can wash their hands as soon as the glue task is done. Let's finish the glue and then we will wash our hands. We will wash our hands. We can say that the whole time we're doing the activity with glue. We will wash our hands. To provide input, this is where these kids are gonna need sensory exploration bins, big bins with rice, toys inside, um, maybe even the manipulatives for a certain activity are inside and they're deep digging their hands into their eyes to pull out the right manipulative. Um, they also may benefit from a strip of Velcro under their chair, or under their desk that they can just rub while they're sitting and listening. And then a lap pad with different textures, um, minky or velvet or the flippy sequins or something rough that they can just rub and feel while they're listening to a lesson so that they can regulate. The visual system is our sense of sight or vision. The receptors are rods or cones located in the retina of the eye, and it provides information about color, size, brightness, shape, texture, depth, and space. So our over-responsive kids are going to be easily distracted by movement. So if there is any sort, if there's an open window and there's any sort of um, moving activity outside or um, it's a kind of cloudy day and the clouds are going across the sun and it's bright and it's cloudy and it's bright and it's cloudy or um, there's a bird outside, they're constantly going to be directing their eyes towards that. They may rub their eyes frequently and they may be sensitive to light. So this is where, um, and we'll talk about that in the next slide, but where the covers over the bright lights in classrooms um, may be helpful. An under-responsive reaction is a child who has spatial difficulties. Um, they may stem their hands or objects in front of eyes. And you may see a kid who just like flicks the pencil in front of their eye like this. Um, a lot of people may see that and think, oh, they need a fidget when actually they're probably um, stemming their eyes instead of their hands. They may be mesmerized by spinning toys or the light coming through blinds. So um, if you're in a bright room and the, and the blinds are causing there to be like a a line shadow on the floor, they may stem there or want to sit right there or look directly um, kind of at that shadow that's being cast. So to remove input, we could dim lights or put the um, guards over the bright lights. Um, they could work in a corner of the classroom without visual movement, provide um, a black background or a tri-board around their work to help them visually focus on what they're supposed to be focusing on. And to provide input, I love these sensory um, bubblers uh, that you can make with a water bottle or you can buy the ones that do like the um, the little bubbles. They are very organizing and they're a very um, easy way for a child to get that input, um, regulate, let everything, look at it, let everything settle. Once everything settled, come back to their work for a little while. The auditory system. Um, this is a sense of hearing. Receptors are located in the inner ear and the cochlea, and it provides information about sound, language, and localization of sound in the environment. So an over response would be covering ears or getting upset with sound. They are easily distracted by auditory stimuli. They're not gonna be the kid that works well with background noise, and they may hum or sing to the self, con to self constantly. So this is when it gets confusing because a child who's making a lot of noise, you don't often think, oh, they're over responsive to noise because they're the one making it. But oftentimes what they're doing is in a classroom that's very loud and busy, they are trying to get their voice above everything else to kind of control the volume. So if they are afraid, so their fight or flight response there is that they're afraid of a loud noise. And so they are being the most controlled loud noise to avoid surprises is kind of what they're doing there. Um, but that's just an automatic reaction. It's not, that's not like mentally what they're thinking through. It's kind of an automatic fight or flight reaction to sound. If sound is scary, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna control the sound right now with my own voice. Under response would be requiring music to concentrate or making, again, making noises. So it's kind of hard to tell is, are they making noises because they need more input or because they're trying to control the input? And they may speak louder than necessary. This is a child who, um, may have that one voice volume and, and can't really regulate it. Noise canceling headphones can be a good strategy here and a calm down space. 
um, for input for this, and this is one you really have to kind of test out because um, it's hard to tell that the from the past slide, the indicators that we're looking for are very similar. So you might want to just do some trial and error here. Do you need headphones with no noise or do you need some input in these headphones? And I like to search music for vertigo on YouTube and let kids listen to that modulated music. Um, it's very intense, but it does really help um, receive that auditory input. It actually provides a little bit of vestibular input, so this could be a strategy for the vestibular sense as well and can help regulate kids. Olfactory and gustatory systems work very closely together. They have the sense of smell and taste. Over responsive, we have picky eaters and an overactive gag reflex. Under responsive, we have kids who chew on non food objects. This is the kid with the smashed eraser on their pencil, and they are sniffing objects. They're going to smell the markers before they color, and they may overstuff their mouth. So, um, putting way too much food, you might need a little bit of a pacing visual for them one bite at a time or a mirror at the table. Make sure your mouth is empty before you put more food in to kind of cue them. Removing input for these kids looks like letting them self-explore food, so not force feeding. And providing input would look like giving them a nuke brush, which is like, like a bumpy brush. Oh, I have one right here. <laughs> and letting them, um, or allowing them to rub the inside of their mouth, or let, or if they are comfortable letting an adult rub the inside of their mouth with, with a brush like that. A chewy tube, they can chew on, um, even like a jewelry necklace that they can chew on when they're working instead of biting their pencil. You can increase the temperature and flavor of their food. So um, a way I like to do this is frozen orange juice popsicles because it's very sour and cold and crunchy and that's going to increase that sensory input. That's a good um, snack before um, they go to school or something to have with their breakfast. You wouldn't think an orange juice popsicle is the best thing for breakfast, but it could help these kids who are chewing all day long. And then a vibrating toothbrush would be very helpful for them. Other classroom strategies that could help with the kids and their sensory um, needs. Clear, consistent routines each day. So if the child understands what's going to happen each day, they're going to be more regulated and be able to um, express what parts of the day are um, helpful for them, what parts of the day are not, because they have that routine. And, and, and you can also help them. We always have trouble when we come in from recess. Okay, what? why is that? What's going on there? Um, and you can help them figure out some strategies to regulate during that time. Um, individual visual schedules may be necessary for some kids so that they can even more know what to expect and and so when you have these responses where you're getting a fight or flight response with those kids that are over responsive and then they go into this panic mode anything that we can do to help them feel like they have more um, control and safety in their environment is going to help them um, regulate during those fight or flight responses providing a calm down space for children that space that is very neutral in what kind of sensory input is in there and, and it's very um, consistent. They know if I go in this space, it's going to be quiet. It's going to be dim. Um, it's going to be soft, you know, and, and even setting a time where you can be in here for three minutes and then you need to return um, could be a good um, break for these children. Providing clear, consistent and frequent positive reinforcement providing alternate seating or tape boundaries around a circle spot. So if um, children are sitting at the carpet, even something like a little bit of tape around their spot, you know, they may have a spot, but once they sit on the spot, they can't see it anymore. But if you provided a little bit of a tape square around their area and they can see their boundaries, that could help. And then offering choices within your expectations for a child who you are noticing is consistently getting over or under um, res responding to the environment and especially the kids that are over responding and you know that the next activity is going to be something that usually causes a reaction for them when it's time to transition to that thing they can't avoid it they have still have to do it but giving them choices within that okay we're going to move on to math and for whatever reason 
math may cause a reaction for this child. And you know this. So you can say, we're going to move on to math. You can do math in your seat, or you can do math on the bean bag, or you can do math at the desk with the tribe board around you. You know, giving some choices of we're going to do this, but which sensory choice would you choose to complete this task? When in doubt, if you can, if you're seeing um, signs of three different sensory areas, and I don't even know where to start, always start with heavy work. Heavy work is always going to be regulating. So those are the animal walks. Those are the heavy pushing a cart. That's the heavy backpack. That's um, push-ups. That's a big hug. That's your weighted lap pad. These are the, the suggestions that are going to be a great starting point no matter what sense is being affected. Here's some more strategies that involve heavy work. Animal crawling during transitions. So, all right, it's time to put away our notebooks and get out our lunch. Everyone bunny hop to do that task, you know, and, and they all get a chance to get that input. Heavy backpack during hallway transitions. So maybe one particular child is in charge of carrying out the, um, the bag to the playground that contains your first aid kit or your walkie talkie. Handprints on the wall for a place to push. So a visual of, of two hands on the wall and a child can place their hands there and push the wall could be a good visual. Washing windows and whiteboards. Laying on the tummy for fine motor work or reading. So this is actually, you know, we would think of a child laying down while they're working as, as more of a lazy position. But if a child is laying on their tummy and propping on their elbows, they're actually using a lot more upper body um, stability and muscles and the joints are all activated more than when they're sitting up and riding. So it actually may increase their whole musculature in this area if they are laying on their tummy and propping on their elbows. And then stacking or stocking shelves with heavy items. So um, in some questions, it may be helpful just to have a shelf, an empty shelf and a full shelf with some sort of color coding and they are just moving items from one shelf to the other to do their work. Um, it may be that there are shapes and colors and on this shelf they have to organize by shape and on this color they have to organize by color just to stack it up. It can be very organizing to do a job like that. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, um, you can email me or um, you can visit my YouTube page, My OT Homework, where I have a bunch of exercises and activities that could be helpful for kids um, in OT or not in OT, but um, needing some sensory help or some fine motor help.